This begins the E544 on Friday, January the 24th, 2014. Okay. Are we on? Okay. Can we go to the overhead camera, please? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so last time we had a, a good time with our frequency analysis. And then, of course, we did a uh, Fourier series. And just remind you, the Fourier series that I used was this one, um, the exponential Fourier series, uh, rather than sinusoidal or cosinusoidal. <coughs> and that's the, um, obviously the time series in, in terms of the, um, this, the Fourier coefficients themselves. And then um, talked a little bit about the properties just to remind you guys what they were, or that they exist, existed. Um, and then I did a little bit on the Fourier uh, transform, which is just a continuous time version of this, where in the Fourier series, x of t is, is assumed to be periodic, and in fact has to be for it to work. And then um, if it's not periodic, then you have the Fourier transform, which was the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of f, and then e to the j 2 pi f t, and then you're integrating that with respect to f. And of course, this had properties very similar to the tran uh, series. And then I finished up with Parsevals, which was finding the total power in signal, or the power in specific components. So that's what we did last time. Today, I'm happy to say it's going to be so much more exciting. <laughs> I'm being a little bit facetious. We're going to do some more review today. Um, totally different uh, category, though. Um, today, we're going to talk about MOS transistors. Um, I'm going to talk about the structure. the physics, <clears throat> and then models of these transistors. Um, and I'm assuming that you guys have all had this sort of stuff before. What is up with that door? Are they messing with it out there? <laughs> We've got our uh, enforcer over here pushing people away from the door. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's like an automatic door. It keeps wanting to open. I don't, I don't know what the deal is with it. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll talk about transistors today. So jumping right in, um, their physical structure is generally given like this. You have a substrate, and then within that substrate you have a region of different... Um, doping. So if this is a P minus substrate, which means lightly doped with holes, usually this is going to be an N plus region here and an N plus region here. It just means that it has a whole lot more um, dopants than, than the P minus region. 
And then I'm going to draw this kind of as a three-dimensional thing here. Uh, just just for this drawing. I don't think I'll do this for the whole thing just because it takes me a long time. Um, this is the gate. Um, and it's connected to something else. And the gate is made of metal or polysilicon, something that conducts well. And then between the gate and this region down here is um, an insulator, most commonly silicon dioxide because uh, it's easy to put on silicon. And then if we're going to label the, the parts of the actual transistor itself, um, like I've done with the gate, this part over here we'll call the drain, and this part over here we'll call the source. And for most cases, um, unless you have other connections within the circuit, the source and the drain are interchangeable. Um, usually, when it comes to actually calling something the source of the drain, the source is the place where charge-carrying particles um, originate, and the drain is where they go. So just in case you need to be reminded of that. So N plus um, is doped with a large number of uh, donor atoms. So it'll have um, more electrons floating around in there than there are atoms. And P minus is um, doped with a smaller number of acceptors. So it'll have fewer electrons floating around in there and more what are called holes. Um, and to be complete, there this is a this is an NMOS transistor. I'm going to draw a PMOS just really quickly. So in a PMOS, instead of having a, a P-type substrate, you're going to have an N-minus substrate. Um, P-plus in the source and drain. And everything else is pretty much the same. So this is the gate. It's still metal. This is your insulator. Insulator. Um, and again, we can call this the drain and the source, and that, like I said before, just really depends on how the transistor is hooked up in the circuit. Um, and so within both of these types of transistors, you'll have contacts, um, in other words, places where you can make electrical connections at, um, at the gate, the drain, the source, and depending on what kind of technology you're working with, sometimes um, the, the bulk, which is not uncommonly referred to as the back gate, Basically, that, that just means that you'll have some electrical connection to this area down here, and the transistor will be um, sealed off from the surroundings by some, um, some type of well. Um, that part, sorry, that part really isn't that important for right now. So that's the structure of the PMOS. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty basic. Uh, and there's not really a whole lot to say about that unless you want to start getting into what are donors and what are acceptors and, and that kind of stuff and how it's built using lithography, which we don't really want to do. Uh, could you take my picture out of that thing? Thanks. Now you can see more of it. You guys don't need to see me, and the people who are watching remotely probably don't care. <laughs> right? So let's talk about the physics of the MOSFET. So this applies to both PMOS and NMOS. And I'm going to do it for an NMOS because that's the most common way to do it. Um, the difference between PMOS and NMOS is that in a PMOS, the a majority charge carriers 
um, is in, in the channel is going to be holes rather than electrons. So whenever I say electrons, think holes for PMOS, and you'll be right on track. So let's go ahead and make my drawing here. So I'm not going to do it three-dimensionally now. I'm just going to do it two-dimensionally, like we're looking at it straight off from the side. So this is my gate. This is either source or drain, or this is either source or drain. So <clears throat> this is the, the transistor in, in equilibrium, basically. Nothing's happening. And plus... And plus, so there's a lot of E minus running around in here. The time is 17 uh, o'clock. Electrons. And then there's um, holes down here. So um, I kind of call those E plus. They have the same charge as an, as an electron, but they're positively charged. So then we're going to hook up a, a voltage source to the gate and attach it between um, basically the gate and ground and also um, to one of the, the sides. So N plus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw what I just said so that it's, it's less confusing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to ground this side electrically. And then I'm going to put a voltage source here. And then I'm also going to ground this side. And I want to do this just to talk about what's going to happen as I start to change that voltage source. So that's some VDC. So as VDC increases, um, minority carriers carriers in the bulk are going to be drawn towards the, are drawn towards the gate. So this is P minus down here, which means that the minority carriers down here are the electrons. So my electrons are going to be drawn up here by the field induced by this, this voltage source. And eventually, what we're going to have is a layer of electrons. So this is still M plus, this is still M plus. So I have the same drawing. Oh, sorry, was I off the screen? You guys feel free to let me know if I if I go off the screen. It's, um, it's always a challenge for me to keep track of where the camera is. But so um, in in the channel, which is this region between these two guys. Eventually, you will accumulate enough, um, in this case, free electrons um, to, to invert um, the substrate. And what that means is that down here you have P minus, so maybe you have 1 times 10 to the, let's say, 14 um, holes per um, cubic centimeter. Um, and when you get inversion, you have this layer here um, so this is my inverted channel. And it's going to have, since it's inverted, it means it has 1 times 10 to the 14 electrons in that small layer right there. So that's what we mean when we say inversion. That's a technical definition, minus per centimeter cubed. Um, and that's basically what's going to happen. So that is, um, this is what we say, or mean when we say the transistor's on. We mean that we have a, an inverted channel underneath the gate and that electrons are basically free to travel from the, the source to the drain or vice versa. Okay. 
So let's continue on. So the next thing to do is obviously try to get electrons to move. Um, so let's draw more. So I have my same circuit. I still have this DC source here. And I'm now I'm going to put a small DC source here. So this is going to be what you would call VDS. And this is going to be VGS. Um, okay. So it's my insulator. Here's my channel. So what's going to happen if I put a small voltage source here? In the, in the channel, my electrons are going to go that way because they want to go towards the positive source. And my current flow is basically going to go this way. So that's current flow. Because current, current is always considered to flow in the direction of positive charge. So since negative charge is flowing that way, that means positive charge is flowing that way. So let me write down what I've done here. Applying a small uh, VDS means that current flows complete my picture. Current flows from, in this case, for, for an NMOS, current flows from the drain to the source. So the, like I said before, the, the source is now sourcing electrons and they're going into the drain. Um, for a PMOS it would be the opposite. The source would source holes and they go into the, into the drain and that would be the direction of, of current flow. Okay, more pictures. So I still have this voltage source here, VGS. And I still have VDS. But now VDS is going to get larger. So as VDS gets larger, the channel um, starts to become pinched off. And what that means is basically the channel is not going to be uniform, uniform width all the way across the transistor now. Instead, of, instead, it's going to be like this. So, this is still my insulator. So, electrons are still going to flow this way, but as you get closer to this, this large, larger voltage, it's going to have depleted this region of electrons, right? Because they're all just going to get swept into the, into the drain. Um, and this is actually, when the channel becomes um, pinched off so that the depth of the channel at the drain for, a P, uh, for an NMOS. Actually, the depth of the channel at the drain for either, either type, um, when that becomes, when that depth right at the, at the edge of the drain becomes zero, that is saturation. Or the beginning of the saturation region. So right at the drain. And then of course, <clears throat> as you increase this voltage even further, your channel will become even more pinched off and you'll actually have um, an incomplete channel. And that's what happens as you move further into the saturation region. So I'm just going to draw that really quick. Um, and probably not put any words by it. Um, So this is VGS, again VDS. And so as VDS becomes very large um, with respect to VGS, your channel can become so pinched off that there's actually now um, a width here that 
the channel does not span. And if you remember uh, channel length modulation, this is exactly what's happening. Um, the channel length has now actually been changed by um, applying such a large voltage here that it, it overcomes VGS. So this is what we mean by channel length modulation. There's no E in, mo in modulation. So when you get to this point, electrons will start to move over here, and then they'll run into this region where they're, there's not a channel, so it's not easily, easy for them to move, but the transport's going to be ballistic. So it's basically just going to um, mean that they have enough momentum in most cases to get them from here to here. Okay? Nothing new there, right? Everything you, everything you guys know about transistors in like two pages, right? Plus, well, you guys probably know more than that, hopefully. Um, and if not, you're probably fine. Um, you'll get more, a little bit more review when he starts actually using transistors in class. So now the last part of transistors is the models. And this is basically where you get into the math. So, in general, we often assume that um, current going into the gate is zero. Is zero. Um, and that's kind of a low frequency assumption. And then, again, often the bulk will be shorted or connected to the source. Yeah, the source. So those are kind of two assumptions that we're going to we're going to kind of work off of here. So there's three region of operations for, for the transistor. Um, I kind of gave them up here. Um, so when you have no channel, um, you're cut off or just off. When you start to have a channel, the you'll first be in the linear region when VDS is small. And then as you start to increase VDS, you'll get into what I remind you was the saturation region. So first off, the simplest of them all, cut off. Um, draw my transistor again. Just to remind you what's happening. So in cut off, essentially, VGS is zero for, for our argument's case. Um, no channel is formed. Um, and in this case, we use the simplest model possible for the current traveling between the drain and the source, and we say it's zero. So mathematically, when we're doing a simple analysis by hand, we're going to assume that in this case there's no current. Okay, now the linear region. Um, so now my VDS is not going to be so small. Or my VGS, I'm sorry. Plus, plus. Okay. 
So VGS. So in the linear region, VGS is greater than a threshold voltage. And the threshold voltage is basically the voltage required to invert the channel. So there's a channel here. It's got electrons that are able to flow back and forth. And now in order to make this model complete, I need to consider a VDS here. So I have a channel. I have VGS is greater than, than VTH. And the other uh, stipulation is that VDS is less than the difference between VGS and the threshold voltage. So in this case, electrons are free to travel back and forth, and we assume that there's not, you know, too much adverse effect from the channel length or the channel depth changing across the, the length of the transistor. And so here, the current IDS is for an n-type. It's k sub n, width over length, VDS times VGS minus VTH minus VDS over 2. Okay. So there's a quadratic dependence on, on the, the VDS voltage. Um, so as it goes up, the um, current will actually uh, one second. That's not exactly 100% clear. Um, okay. I was going to say that as VDS goes up, the current's going to go up quadratically, but that's not quite the case because it's actually going to go down because it's minus 2. I hope I wrote Does this look familiar? Because I'm starting to doubt that now. That's right? Okay. Um, so Kn is mu n uh, times the capacitance of the gate. Um, this is the mobility of the electrons in the bulk. And uh, the gate capacitance is um, the gate capacitance per unit um, area, I believe. Um, I can't, remember, I can't remember what the exact units are on that, um, but they're probably not too important yet. Um, but basically you have, uh, yeah, it's going to be per unit area. So you have the mobility times the um, relative, pardon? Yeah, it's per unit area, right, of the transistor. Um, so the, this is the relative permi permittivity um, times the, times the naught. So that's the permittivity of the actual insulator, and this is the thickness of that insulator. So that's what happens in, in the linear region. And finally, of course, we have saturation. course, draw my transistor again, and like I said before, in saturation the channel has become pinched off. So my channel here now does not traverse the entire length or just barely um, is cut off before it gets to the drain. So, obviously in saturation, the channel's pinched off. Um, so the, the values that describe this in terms of voltage, the voltages in the circuit are VGS is greater than the threshold voltage. So you, you had a channel, but then by a way of um, disturbing that channel with, with VDS, 
you've now pinched it off. Um, so instead of being less than this value up here, it's now greater than that value, VGS minus VTH. And the current, of course, is now um, only dependent on VGS unless we include channel length modulation. And this is assuming no channel length modulation. Um, and in the case that you want to include channel length modulation, it should look like this. And this is the channel length modulation factor. Oh, well, you can write it as one plus or one minus. It really depends on yeah you know, how you define it. Um, we'll make it a plus. Uh, and there's other ways to write the same thing. I have a, a different one on the next page. Um, but essentially what you're left with is the channel, the amount of current going through the channel depending now on VDS by this factor of lambda. And let's see. And these equations give rise to the, your common Thank you. Uh, the common curve that you see. Um, let's see one. They look kind of like this, and usually they're separated by VGS equals, you know, some value. Um, Twenty eight volt, and then of course as VGS increases, you'll have this. So they, you know, I'm just kind of drawing these just to remind you what they look like um, and to give you some, some hints. So this elbow here is kind of determined by the, um, well, it should have moved in a little bit more, um, so it should, should actually go like this. So this is a line of VGS um, minus VTH, right? So um, the right side of this you're in saturation on the left side of this, you're in linear. And if this line over here has any slope at all, in other words, it's going up, um, that's an indicative of channel length modulation. And I've kind of drawn it going up a little bit, so I'm assuming that there's some channel length modulation. So those are the simple equations that we usually use. Um, there, there are other effects that, um, that you can take into account or attempt to take into account. Um, you probably will have a really hard time doing it by hand uh, simply because the equations start to get really complicated. And if you're doing a circuit that has any, any um, interesting features, you know, it's going to start bogging you down. So, so these form the basis of the simple models that we will use for transistor operation. Um, and other effects of note. In other words, things that you might want to keep in mind if you're having a, a circuit that's behaving strangely. Um, 
course, there's channel length modulation. Um, mobility degradation. Um, and this comes about because of a number of things. Um, VDS can get very large and basically accelerate the electrons to the uh, saturation velocity in here so that they can't go any faster and actually they start going slower. Um, so if you combine that with a short channel, um, then you have the results are there's more energy per carrier. Um, resulting in more collisions. And that's basically what I was saying. So more collisions between the carriers. So mobility degradation. So that's kind of one cause for mobility degradation. Um, another cause are going to be vertical fields. Um, and this basically pulls carriers towards the gate. Um, slash insulator. So if you look at, say this case right here, if you have a large VGS, electrons are going to go start to leave this uh, the source, and they're going to go kind of in a curved path up towards the gate, right? And so those pulling it up towards towards the gate has a couple of effects. Number one, the um, the density of states by the surface is different. than it is in the bulk. So, you know, you have the, the nice um, band diagrams for bulk silicon. Well, that, that all changes once you get near the, near, the, um, near the surface because instead of being in a, in a bulk situation, you're now in kind of a two-dimensional situation where you have um, a different density of states. So you have less states and also, you know, the roughness of the surface itself can affect the, the, the transport. So it can actually collide with imperfections in that surface itself. And in extreme cases, the electrons can actually get pulled up into the insulator, and that's, that's a hot electron effect that you guys may have heard about. Um, I must have talked really fast. Was I talking super fast? Okay. Because <laughs> I, got, I got through a lot more than I actually planned on. Um, so let's save this, the next stuff for, for next time. Um, I'm going to start talking about... Uh, frequency analysis of circuits, and then um, transistor models uh, that you can actually use to kind of see what's actually going on in a transistor um, in, a, in an AC situation rather than a DC situation. All the models that I gave today are basically considered DC models. You're not assuming that things are changing quickly inside the transistor. Um, and I'll talk about basically how you come so let me just say this next time. Um, small signal transistors and AC circuits. And probably in the opposite order, but um, basically the small signal model comes from the DC model of the transistor plus some other stuff. But I'll show you all that stuff next time and we'll talk about um, a simple transistor circuit, which happens to be a, what is this thing called? Um, I think that's a, a common source uh, circuit. So I'll talk about that next time. Uh, in the meantime, have a good weekend. And if, I, if you have questions, my office hours are right after this, so I'll, I'll be over there, okay? All right, guys, thanks a lot.
concludes the discussion for EE 544 on Friday, January 24, 2014.